Anyway, hi. I'm Andrew Greenberg. Uh, I wear a few different hats. I uh, serve on the board of the DeKalb County Economic Development Authority. Anyone from DeKalb County here? Excellent. Pack in the room. Uh, in addition, I, uh, the executive director of the Georgia Game Developers Association, we put on an investment conference in October, the Southern Interactive Entertainment Game Expo uh, Digital Entertainment Investment Conference. So if you're looking to do a game startup or a digital media startup of any type, come out and visit us. I've done a few startups of my own, consult with a lot of different startups. Uh, get too often asked to be advisors on startups so I can help them crash quickly. And uh, come to our panels tonight. Uh, we'll be doing one on VR at 10 p.m. And the most important panel at DragonCon is the one I do tomorrow at 8.30, which is 10 Rules of Dealing with Police Encounters. Most important panel you can see at DragonCon. All right, I'm uh, David Hansen. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at the College of Charleston. Been there over a decade. Um, I, my research is focused on how, how originally on on how people recognize opportunities, and that's evolved into really seeing how ideas evolve from their initial conception to what eventually gets launched, which is always something different. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've been teaching this stuff for a long time. I'm Jim Nettles. Um, I have a, con or I've been a business and technology consultant for a lot longer than I want to admit. <laughs> Um, I actually sold my first system when I was 14, which was also a very long time ago. Um, I have, I, and I do consulting in a, in a variety of fields. Most everything I do is in the tech field, software, engineer, you know, that side of things. Uh, I do all, I also do some work around manufacturing, operations, these sorts of things. Uh, I deal a lot with startups. I help, you know, lay out plans. I help lay out the operational models. Uh, and basically strategy planning for, for those and pretty much you either come to me when you're trying to start up or more often when you should have come to me when you started up and now you're on fire. Um, I've started up a number they of different... They got the joke. <laughs> <laughs> yes, be warned, lots of bad jokes this morning. Um, so I've, I've sort of been around the block. I've been a partner in companies. I'm a partner in a number. In fact, we're launching one this weekend while we're here. Um, I'm both a fiction and a nonfiction author. Um, I have a book that is coming out on the business side of being an author later this year. Um, we're going to have modules coming out on the business side of being an artisan, software development, software companies. Um, probably in 2020, we're coming out with modules about being an attorney and healthcare, uh, a number of other those other facets as well. So I sort of flip flop back and forth on both sides. Right. With your moderating? Yeah, I guess Yay. so. <laughs> Yay, I'm not. I'm going to sleep. So um, just to, to figure out where everybody's at, how many people currently own a business? All right. Uh, how many are in the process of starting? Okay. Um, how many people are thinking about starting a business? All right. Um, Let me ask one more question yeah. on top of that. Of you guys that are thinking about starting a business. How many are insane? How many? <laughs> well, none of you are. How many of you have been thinking about it for more than a year? What the hell's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> it's $100 to register a company. That's the problem. Oh. <laughs> or they don't know what business to start. That's why they're here. Oh, that's why we're here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, since I am a professor, I have to give a pop quiz. <laughs> so, um, I've got uh, several companies here. Uh, I want to see how many of you actually are familiar with them. So, the first one is Odeo. Do you know what that is? Okay, that's Twitter. <laughs> they started as a podcast company. Yep, uh, and so the, the funny story with them was that they, um, they were running out of money. Uh, their investors wanted their money back. So some people lost out on investing in Twitter. Um, the Point, anybody heard of that? That's Groupon. 
They started out as a company that, uh, that organized like uh, social movements. Um, and that wasn't working out, and then they ended up selling pizzas uh, or getting coupons for pizzas. Um, game never ending. No. Anyone? Flickr. Yes, that was, um, I believe what happened there was that the, the, the best thing about the game was sharing pictures. <laughs> Tells you a lot so, about their game design. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so they just focused on what was working. Um, bourbon. No, scotch. <laughs> uh, that's Instagram. It was uh, originally a check-in app. Uh, and tote. Pinterest. So, um, oh, and YouTube started out as a dating website. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> <laughs> You're dating yourself. <laughs> So th the main point there is that your idea is going to change, and you find what works. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do is next is just kind of um, have each of you talk a little bit about how um, some projects you've worked on or the companies you've worked with and how they've evolved into something else. Okay. Um, well, I actually pick on uh, the current project, Author Essentials. This started about three years ago for me um, as I had enough friends that were authors coming and going, you're one of those weird business technical people. And for creative people, people like me are kind of odd. Um, but I flip flop between both sides. You'll probably hear me say that a lot today. Um, but it started off as, you're one of those people, can I ask a question? I'm like, sure. And I'd go through, I'd explain the answer, and they'd come back and go, that's really nice. Now can you tell me what all of that meant? That sounded really good. And I, I, write, um, I write for a number of journals. I, I can, I'm a contributor um, both under my name and some other names, and I also generate content for some people in tech and business and futurism and, and these different avenues. And I was like, oh, I can go crank something. I, I went looking for a book I could hand to them and say, go read this and then come ask me your questions. And then it became a website where it started being, you know, Q and A's and posting some articles and things like that tied to things that were coming up. And then now it's manifested into um, a, a full blown. I've got several partners in it where we're we're now doing video workshops, which is the first thing we're launching this weekend. There's a book series that starts coming out for that this year. In terms of other things I've done that that morph over time. Um, I was in a part. I was a partner in a small software company. We were building modules um, geared around Excel for financial systems, financial tools, doing a lot of of automation, macros type work, and that was really nice and really popular when Lotus One Two Three <laughs> was still the king of the hill, and we had built a lot of things, and that company was growing very quickly, and then IBM bought them. And if you don't know, the death knell for any software is for IBM to buy them. <laughs> so the next thing is we've got all these cool modules we can't do anything with. I've got a couple of developers, and out of that, we spun off a consulting company to come in and help small and medium-sized businesses that had built complete and total platforms, their entire business models and whatnot, using Lotus to get them transformed over to Microsoft and Excel, and Excel platforms. So we did that for several years as a, as a company to go through transformation. So it's all about what happens to your market that you may or may not expect. Yeah, I'll talk about two pivots that I've been involved in, one in the past and one actually right now. So with uh, my company, my main company, Holistic Design, we are a classic video game, role-playing game company. Fading Suns is our main line. We were, had good success with that, started in 95, had good success with this through the 90s, classic model where the publishers would give us an advance, we'd make a game, they would sell a bunch of them, and we'd get royalties on the back end. And uh, that worked uh, pretty well up until about the first Bush recession in 2000. And uh, suddenly the publisher model started changing and we had to change with it. And we tried. Uh, so we've been what we would call single A developer. We develop good games, would sell good numbers, but are never going to sell a million units uh, and the like, which suddenly the publishers all want million unit deals. So we try and pivot to that. 
two of our publishers die on us. We're getting burned out on it. We do one game that's a really good success, not under that model, in the traditional model called Mall Tycoon. At that point, we're burned out. And so we just go ahead and pivot, partly because the market's changed, partly because we're burned out, and start licensing our IP instead of developing new games and new IP. And it was a change, but it was one that fit us and fit what the market then, what we could do with that market. Uh, and now we're pivoting again, going into uh, multi-platform games. We've got a game called Noble Armada, uh, shipping September 13th. We actually did a Kickstarter and already fulfilled all our Kickstarters a month ahead of schedule. But uh, we're pivoting again, again, more to that crowdsourced uh, help on testing, on funding, and all those things. Uh, and trying that right now. Another pivot I'm involved in right now, I told you I run the Georgia Game Developers Association, so we represent game developers in the state. Georgia is actually the seventh largest state for game development in the country. And what we found is that our members are starting to hire more and more out of their esports community than out of traditional avenues. So while we are still representing the game developers, lobbying on their behalf, doing training and so forth, we're finding that what we also need to do is build an esports community here in Georgia. So esports is huge in Georgia. We've got E-League, we've got the uh, High Res Championship, we've got the Blue Mammoth Championship, other Momocon, other big events. Uh, but th those are big events. We don't have the teams forming here. We don't have the esports competitive talent at the level we need it to. So we're actually having to pivot to try and build that kind of talent as opposed to just game dev. So it's an interesting process seeing what you have to do for your customer base or for your own sanity and pivoting to fill those needs. And I'm glad you used the word pivot plenty of times. <laughs> so um, you've probably heard that word used before. Um, it comes out of the Lean Startup. Um, Eric Reese claims to have uh, sort of coined that term um, in an early blog. So Eric Reese, how many of you have heard of him? So he's written a book, The Lean Startup. He's built a business around that whole concept. Um, so the idea of a lean startup is to um, start obviously small um, with trials to basically what he talks about is doing experiments that it's all about doing little experiments to learn what works what's not working and changing before you spend a lot of time and money developing something um, and this comes from uh, Steve Blank uh, who came up with the concept of customer development. Um, he's a, he was a serial entrepreneur in uh, Silicon Valley, eventually started teaching at Stanford and, and developed this concept. Um, but the basic idea is rather than, uh, well, what he was seeing was people sitting at home, coding, 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 after a year or so and launching something and failing because whatever they were doing, nobody really wanted it. So what he's suggesting is go out and talk to people. Talk to your customers. Interview them. Uh, so I've, I've developed a little uh, sort of, uh, I have an interview protocol that I have my students go out and do, um, starting with just focusing on some kind of activity uh, that they're interested in because, you know, these are students. 21, 22 years old, they don't know what they want to do yet, they don't have an idea. If they do have an idea uh, for business, I tell them to forget it, it sucks. I've heard it before. I guarantee I've heard it before and it's not gonna work. What you gotta do is go out and find a pain in the market. So go talk to people, ask them, yeah, a pain, a pain in the market. Um, and this basic idea of, uh, from venture capital, they would say, you know, you, they're interested in the aspirin, not the vitamin, right? Because people are going to pay to relieve pain. So go out and talk to people about the activity, tell them uh, to describe why they do it, how they go about doing it, what they like about it, and most importantly, what they dislike. Well, and then what they do about that. Yeah, and so uh, with consulting work that I do, I mean, typically when I'm coming in and having a strategy conversation, I get phone calls in, in one of two cases. And this is true of both one-person startups and when I've done work for Fortune 50s, is it's the same thing. I can tell people, you can write me a check now for this. We'll lay something out. We'll take a look. We'll come up with a plan. We'll do some mitigation. We'll do some planning. 
Or you can write me the big check when things are on fire. And by the way, when things are on fire, it's going to cost you a hell of a lot more. And there's ways of going and piloting things out. There, there's something called the ask method. If you're not used to trying to communicate with customers, um, and I just went blank on who, who developed it, um, I've, I've recommended this to a few people, um, but it's called the ask method. And it will help you go through how to query and how to talk to customers and how to find pain points because you're exactly right. People will pay to cure a problem a lot faster than they will go and say, this gives me a benefit I didn't even know I had a problem for. Yep. Now. <coughs> Well, that's where you're talking about Steve Jobs. Yep. Do you need to repeat the question? Yeah. Um, so the question was, you know, we're, we're talking about fixing the pain for somebody that already has a situation that recognizes the pain. Right. How do we go to that next step with somebody who, you know, you don't necessarily know that you have that transformative product. How do you break into that a la, you know, if you ask, you know, if Henry Ford had been asking around, asking the question, you know, what do you want? You know, a better horse, a better buggy whip, not the car. Is that really an improvement? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, is the minivan an improvement? But that depends on what you do. No, and it's an excellent question. So how do you know when you have something that's transformative? I currently am C-level officer for a green technology company that we're trying to use to break in. Um, we're, we're in pilot mode right now with some of the technology, some of the manufacturing. We've invested a lot of time, energy, and money into actually educating the market on what's going on because it's very hard to get past that curve. I mean, nobody knew 15 years ago that this would run our lives. And I will tell you, they fly very well. <laughs> that's why I have an OtterBox. Um, but when you have something that's transformative, you have to have a completely different mindset. And if you have never run a company before, even if you've just never gone and done something where you're the one that's responsible for the business, trying to do something that's that transformative is going to be a nightmare because you don't have the basic skills on how to run a business. So I, I'm going to ask a question for my panelists. Define business. Define having a business. So uh, for mine, it is uh, creating something that I want to be involved with that people will pay me money to do on a sustainable basis. Yeah, I would just say it's selling something to somebody. I entirely disagree. Okay. Having a business is having the mechanics and the engine by which you can then deliver some product or another. You walk through all the different companies that pivoted and transformed their mm -hmm. products. The reason they were able to pivot was they already had a structure and people in place they already had an engine in place. They already had a frame in place. They already had a foundation in place. They could then go and say, what market, what products do I go to? If you can build a proper foundation first, and you can kind of then learn and shift where your market is and what you can build, and then if you have something transformative, it's a lot easier to introduce it because then you've got some credibility, you've got some background. Not saying you can't come out with this breakthrough product, which is the next X, Y, or Z, but today we're not necessarily sitting in the same period of time as Henry Ford where major innovations could come out of small shops that were the next leap forward. Now we're in a spreading and a widening when people are learning to improve these technologies and when people are learning to find other utilizations for these technologies. I mean, this, while it was a revolutionary device, was combining a phone and a computer. What was revolutionary was doing it in such a way and introducing things that made it useful. From Steve Jobs, his vision was not the tool. It was how to use it and convincing people to use it. That's really what he sold. 
So when you're selling a, a, an innovation and a vision like that, what you're selling is the benefit. You're not selling the tool, you're not selling the widget, you're selling the benefit. And that's key. It's all about the benefit. And, right. I, would, yeah. and I would disagree with the key point you made. Uh, and I think it's important for anyone doing a startup, especially talking about the ask method, you saying what would Ford have created talking to his customers. His customers were actually the car dealers, not the uh, end user. And so what's he, what are his customers wanted? His customers wanted the ability to sell more product, and they needed a product that they could sell more of, yeah, and that's what he gave. The, dealer. the dealers were already in place at the time Ford starts up. Cars were already being oh. sold at the time he comes around. He didn't start a dealer network. You didn't go to the Ford plant to buy them. You went to a dealer. And he sold to his dealers, he knew what his dealers needed, a cheap thing they could sell to a lot more people. Uh, and in addition, when you talk about what to ask people, what do you want to hear, this is very much, and I'll interpret it in game terms, because that's where I come from, in play testing, we know very well that when a gamer complains about something, what they complain about is not the real problem. So the classic issue is when a, a gamer says, they nerfed the paladin. That doesn't necessarily mean that the Paladin is weaker or whatever. It just means they're not having as much fun playing the Paladin as they used to. We need to figure out how to add that fun in. An important part of the ask method, as I'm aware of it, is not just taking down the data, but interpreting what their, really, what their real needs are and their real desires are. And this is important on the creative side. Uh, the pain issue gets a little more complicated when you're talking about creative businesses. And if you, uh, how many of you want to start a business that's kind of on the creative side? All right. Yeah, and then it's very much what you want to do based on also what the market wants. And it's hard to think of that as pain, though there is some pain there. I want to give you something better to do with your free time and your entertainment dollar. Uh, but the question of uh, what does the audience want that I want to create becomes paramount. And the ask is key there. And I'm sorry to get you Yeah, I, I would go back to the, the question of uh, what, what Ford said was, you know, if I ask people what they want, don't ask people what they want ask people what problems they have and then solve it right so the problems was you know the, the horse and buggy wasn't fast enough and scooping right. up the streets yeah so right so you're looking for understanding what their problems are um and then and then trying out different solutions to see what works and, and you and so one of the things steve blank talks about is an mvp so a minimal viable product so getting something in front of customers that they can then give you some feedback on um, and that could be as simple as a, a napkin drawing of what an app looked like. Um, which, and, there, and there's an app for that to actually take pictures of whatever your drawing is and put it in an app form. Uh, <laughs> and it works. It's called uh, prototyping on paper, pop. Um, but it's to get that in front of customers, right? So, so what I have students do after they, they ask these questions about you know, what they like, dislike, and all that is, then they'll present some form of a concept. Uh, it might be just simply a dip description. It might be, you know, a, a really rough app, something, uh, a video, whatever it is. Uh, and then not, I don't ask them, would you, you buy this or would you do that or whatever. It's what would get you to use this? Why would you use this? How would you use this? That's what you want to know. Because uh, if you just ask people, yes no questions you're not going to get anything useful um so it's partly your ability to reinterpret what's yes and recast the paradigm for them yeah so one of the, one of the way one of the things i teach try to teach in class is that you as an entrepreneur going out and starting this you got to think of yourself like a a, a reporter going out and investigating right it's it's getting deep into what people think. And ultimately, what you're looking for when, is, when you're presenting an idea is, uh, or a concept to people is that, can I buy that now? When's it gonna be ready? Now you know you're on the right track. Yeah, when you're talking about fail early and often, yes. uh, it's, a, it's a great way to just put it out in front of people and see what is or is not working. And the Ford Motor Company, by the way, which is my Ford, <laughs> which had a culture that was driven by fear of failure. Yes. Sir. I, and I've worked very, I've worked in a lot of different industries. I've consulted in a lot of different industries from insurance and financial services, which is very, very, very conservative, to where I've consulted in VR, AI, BI, very innovative technologies, where it is about 
you know, fail fast, fail forward, learn from the experience, and keep moving. That's our key to the keyword there, learn. Don't just fail. Yes. Learn what went wrong. Right. Yeah, I say the only failure is not learning. Exactly. Um, and, and I like the Edison quote, I haven't failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I guess we could open up for more questions. Yeah. Hang on, I've got this. Oh, do we got... I have a microphone. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a friend, and he's starting a company. A friend. I use that <laughs> all the time. And I, I don't know his entire business model, but he's kind of doing what you're saying. Like, he's doing, like, you know, 10,000 hours of coding and maybe not testing it as he should. But his biggest fear is patent trolls. And I think that's, like, a reason he gives himself maybe not to start because he's afraid his IP, you know, will be stolen. And I'm curious, like, is that a big concern as much as he's making it to be as far as patent trolls? in terms of avoiding that or any advice you'd give them about patent trolls? Um, so I, I'm actually doing a course on intellectual property here in October. Uh, and I've dealt a lot. I am not an attorney. I am not giving any <laughs> legal advice. Never trust an attorney. Um, but they're necessary evils. From an intellectual property standpoint, if you have taken the actions you need to, to secure it, um, your bigger risk is not violation of your patents because if you have something that's patentable, and that's the first question, is it unique enough to be patentable, trademarkable, all the rest of that? If you have that, go ahead and do the action. Your bigger risk is obscurity. Right. It's when they go, don't care about you that you have problems. Right. Go to, I mean, I, so I've given this, I have, I have told this story before on a number of panels. I had written a book. Year, a, a number of years ago that I wasn't expecting much to happen with it and it started doing pretty well and a friend of mine paid me in and said hey by the way we found a copy of your stuff on Pirate Bay we found a copy of your stuff on da 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 I'm like oh cool somebody cares enough to go steal it and then I did something sneaky working with a couple friends we took and we managed to intercept the main copy that was being distributed cut it in half then I put a link to Amazon on the second half of the book. And it was like, if you enjoy this, now go buy the second half. And we propagated that as a marketing technique. I've used and I've put short stories out into some of the nice, some of the, let's call it the darker side, because it becomes excellent marketing. If people find it, discover it, and like it, they'll come and find your other stuff. If you're worried about it from a software standpoint, um, number one, more than likely his code's not that unique unless he's coming up with something that's an innovative use for it and the way he's doing it. And if he is, then you go ahead and get the patent pending process going and keep working. Be that's going to happen anyway. Yep. If you're worried about it, if you're going to sit in fear, this is... Okay, and this is something I deal with some. My wife actually consults with entrepreneurs and deals largely with that mindset with fear and getting past your own shit. Are there any kids in here? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. You've never heard those words before. Um, <laughs> fear is the number one thing that stops creatives. It's the number one thing that stops business owners. And if you're going to sit and be afraid of what somebody's going to steal from you and you're going to spend more time trying not to produce, don't get into business because you're not going to have the thick enough skin because you have to run forward. Nothing stops you. You run them over, you run them down, you knock them down, you get them the hell out of your way, and you go do what you got to go do. You don't worry about what any, anybody else is doing. If they steal your stuff, you knock them down, you keep going, you go forward, you go forward, you go forward. If you're going to sit in fear and be afraid somebody's going to steal your shit, you're going to sit in fear and you're never going to push anything out the door and you've right. wasted that 10,000 hours. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the, the, the best advice that I've heard entrepreneurs say is just, just do it. Don't wait, do it. If someone's going to steal it, they're going to steal it, right? At some point, you have to go out into the market. Right? 
If your idea is really easy to steal, it's gonna be stolen. What's important is your customers, right? So one of the reasons why you're going out and you're talking to people is you're also building that community of people that will want to buy from you. And then once they buy from you, then they tell other people. And that's how you build up. Yeah. With patent trolls, I mean, the big fear is that you're gonna be sued into oblivion. But obviously more patents are still being uh, mm -hmm. granted than are being blocked by trolls, even in software. So that's definitely a self-blocking one. There are a lot of ones we see on game design and other creative sides. For instance, if I tell anyone about it, they're going to steal my idea. And in the game industry, I mean, ideas are a dime a dozen. Your grandmother has ideas for video games. If you're in the industry, she's told you about them. And so, no. but a lot of people will stop on that. So you, your, your implementation of it is what is trademarked anyway, is what is copyrightable anyway. So go ahead and do your implementation of it. There are all these lists of fears that people will generate and uh, just to make sure that they never have to fail because they never have to start. Uh, but this does bring up an important point that I think every good company very early on should be involved with folks who can tell them what to do and get a good lawyer on board very early on. That first meeting is not that expensive to walk through all the different things they can do. You can handle a lot of things that they'll offer to do for you, like registering your business. But by the same token, you'll now have more of an outline. You paid them a few hundred bucks for that meeting and you know how much it'll cost for them to do different things for you down the line. Uh, if you are afraid of the dollars, and I hate to say this, especially in creative industries, a lot of people are afraid of even thinking about the dollars that will be involved in how much they'll make, how much they'll have to spe uh, spend, et cetera. Bookkeepers and accountants are out there and worth grabbing if you're afraid of that. And I think every entrepreneur should love the number side, but I'm always amazed at how many actually <laughs> despise it. And it's just this whole team of folks and start building up that advisory board. I'm amazed at how handy a free advisory board yep. can be. And uh, on top of that, there are great things. How many folks are in Georgia? I asked the cab before, All right, Georgia. UGA actually has a really good extension of their College of Business and they're located in the metro area and around the state, which will walk you through a lot of this for free. So very handy reference as well. Uh, what was um, could you say the name of that DeKalb County organization again that you mentioned at the beginning? And uh, does it make any sense for just a random resident of DeKalb County, such as myself, to get in touch with them, or does it need to be a bigger operation? Like, what what exactly do they do? Sure. So, uh, as I mentioned for you who weren't here earlier, I serve as a board member of the DeKalb uh, Economic Development Authority. Every county and a lot of the cities have an Economic Development Authority to try and stimulate the growth of business within their borders. Uh, there are a lot of tools we have. A lot of them are more effective for the larger companies, for instance, setting up training programs at the uh, colleges for what their workers need to have and so forth. Uh, but uh, we also do try and encourage small businesses. And uh, there are some services we have for small business. I usually recommend the UGA extension first because they have those tools a lot more readily available. But yeah, there are definitely things we can help with. And as you grow, one of the best things that every county in the state has is a work source board, which can help you with uh, employees, not just finding employees, but they can fund on the job training. They can actually fund the first few months of pay for uh, industries, which we consider important. Most software falls into this. Uh, even f the film industry is considered a high demand career. So there can be support for that and, and similar areas. So there are a lot of public resources that are available that people unfortunately don't know about. And yeah, so coming to someone like us is a good starting point, but we'll be directing you more than giving you money. Um, before I begin, I am an attorney. <laughs> 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 Though I do not do IP, so please do not come to me with your questions. I do energy and environmental law. So from your experience with your companies, what do you see as the future of the attorney or your support staff moving forward? Um, in my current position, um, I always try to give value added to my clients and to my, who I work with, you know, not only look at things through like a legal lens, but 365 degrees with political implications and what have you. So how do you feel about the future of, um, I guess your support roles within your companies that are not necessarily on the creative side, but per se on the support and structural side. So the first thing I'm gonna say is, and I don't know this about you personally, so don't take this the wrong way, attorneys tend to be horrible business people. 
And I actually, I, I get a lot of attorneys as clients who are like, no, no, we're going to take a few little things and tweak them. Now, in terms of support staff, um, and because of the different types of clients I deal with, everything from green technologies, environmental, software, tech, IP, you have to, it, when you do things like I do, you have to have contacts and no attorneys in lots of different verticals. Um, you have to know when to engage them and, and when, where, and why to engage them. And two of the most critical things you can have are a good attorney in your space to at least take a look at contracts, review contracts, and, and put good contracts out the door and help you to navigate that. And number two is your accounting and financial people. Because if you're not an accountant, you're going to discover that after you hit a certain point in business, it's going to cost you a lot more by the time you're done with taxes and things like that to get through it. But attorneys and legal has become so much a large part of our business space and business environment. It's better to have them on the front end and ask a couple of questions and pay a couple hundred bucks about your space and have somebody take a look at that outside of yourself. I'm going to, and I'm going to go back to the literary side just for a minute. Look at attorneys as almost being your editor for a book. That's the person that goes and takes a look at it from a completely separate standpoint that knows the law, that knows the standards, that knows what they're doing, and gives you that review. Because the, the, the top things that I have ever seen and dealt with to get companies and, and people in, into trouble are bad contracts. I'm dealing with that with a client right now. Um, bad contracts or no contracts. Mm -hmm. And then number two is not knowing how to manage the money. So a big fan of having a lawyer involved in the business. I actually used to be a reporter for the Daily Report here in Georgia. If you're local, that's the legal affairs paper. So left that to write about vampires. Uh, so, but uh, bloodsuckers either way. There we go. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I've had the advantage of having the same lawyer since '95 for my businesses. I'm absolutely phenomenal lawyer. Very glad to share him with you if you're interested in creative areas as well. But um, as he said, the editor, I think of them as an editor, they're, they're there to block the risk. And they'll tell you about all the risks that are involved and you've got to decide what level of risk you can accept and what level of risk you necessarily can accept. But on the same token, we've paid our lawyer a lot of money over the years, but he has made us more money than we've paid him and he has saved us far more money than we've paid him. And we're quite aware of that. Uh, involving good lawyers early on and throughout the process, absolutely a great asset. Uh, uh, for a company and uh, if you see the ones that know about your business area they are they can give you all sites, sorts of insights that you don't already have and they're a great level of support in a lot of areas in fact my lawyer now runs our investment conference just because he is so well connected to investors now from his years in the industry that he can just put on the investment conference and we'll get 40 investors just because he knows them personally so there's so many ways a good lawyer can help you above and beyond keeping you from getting sued and getting out of trouble when you are sued. Do you want to talk about basic business formation or we want to go more PowerPoint? No. Oh, um, oh. oh. Well, question. Oh. So as long as we're all here, I'm going to ask uh, you know, a simply stated question that's worth all the money. And if it were easy to answer, I'd probably already look it up on the internet. But speaking of investors, if you don't have a lawyer you've known for 25 years who has a bunch of connections in the investment community, what is a what is a good opening strategy for um, soliciting investment? Because you know I've, I've built a couple prototypes, but I'm at the stage where I think my life would be a lot easier if somebody would write me a check for something between several hundred thousand and you know several million dollars. Uh, but nobody's done that yet. If anybody <laughs> wants to in here, <laughs> great. Uh, but yeah, I'm sort of I'm sort of trying to figure out how to how to start looking into getting some investors. So I, I do some betting for some venture capitalists, um, and I also do a lot of helping people get funded, get plans, get and do that side of things. Um, so the first question you have to ask yourself is, what are you willing to give up? What are you willing to risk in the process? And number two is, what do you have to offer to somebody for that investment? And number three, because like I say, you're not going to have somebody walk over and go, that's brilliant. Here's a check for $3 million. Right. Or like the conversation I was having driving down here on Thursday about $30 million. Um, 
you've got to look and see how much do you need and what are you willing to trade for it. Um, and it's not an easy question. Are you talking debt? Are you talking equity? Are you talking a blend? Um, and if you are talking debt or if you're talking equity, what are you willing to put on the line for it? How much do you believe in it? You know, how much of your company are you willing to give up? I mean, it's there. There's a there are as many ways to get money as there are people on the planet, and it's a matter of once you know how much you need. And know and know the difference between how much you need and however much you think you need. It's not enough. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, however much you think you need, and when you need it, mm -hmm. because cash flow is king. Yes. And you might find out you don't need as much on the initial front end to get your kick off the ground, which means you're not necessarily on the hook to somebody, investors, debt structures, whatever else to go to your prototyping mode, to go to your next your next big bump. And if you get that off the ground, sometimes that then becomes self-funding. It's it's what strategy do you want to go with and how, how much risk do you want to take? Another key aspect of this, and those are absolutely the basics, another key aspect of it is would you invest in you, not your idea, mm -hmm. but you, because yeah. that's really what the investor is interested right. in. So make sure you're someone you would put that kind of money right. into. Uh, we do an investment conference every year at Siege. It'll be October 5th this year. We're about full on applications, but you're welcome to go ahead and apply there. It's SiegeCon, S-I-E-G-E-C-O-N.net, and you'll find a tab for investment conference, and on that tab, you'll find our one-page teaser. And if you're starting a business, I recommend doing a, a one-pager like this. Just fill it out based on where you are now, where you want to be, all those sorts of things. A lot of good information to really start spurring ideas. Uh, they mentioned revenue, and I absolutely agree. There are a lot of different ways to generate the capital you need other than an investor, and often better ways. Uh, bootstrapping, so many game companies start by bootstrapping where they're doing other software services in order to get the funds together to make their games. You will see the basic investment level of what we call friends, fools, and family. Uh, where just people you know will kick in 10,000, et cetera. So I started with a company called White Wolf, and our game Vampire was funded basically by the two owners mortgaging their houses. The, uh, not the owners, the parents of the owners mortgaging their houses. Uh, and uh, that kind of money, uh, they all absolutely got paid back. But uh, that is something else to look at. Are there people who have disposal funds they can get you? Are there other ways to bring in the money? And if you do want to get the investors, I mean, you are giving up a fair amount, but you can also gain things. Part of the idea of investor is not just getting that check for a million dollars. It's what else does the investor bring to the table? Right. Do they have all these connections they need? Can they bring in people to your company, a CTO or a CXO or something like that that you need uh, as for additional talent? Do they have uh, links to other sales networks that would be of benefit right. to you. So don't just look for the check, look for right. the other assets. There are yep. investment conferences throughout uh, the city land. We've got so many going on right now. Uh, we'll actually be doing one in DeKalb, a pitch session. I shouldn't say an investment conference. We're doing a pitch session for people to work on their pitches in, uh, October 20th at our DeKalb Entertainment Expo. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, there are these incubators now popping up everywhere, mm -hmm. not just the co-work spaces, but the actual incubators, I've had friends who've gone through the Georgia Tech uh, Accelerator, Flash, Flashpoint, great program, things like that. If you can get in and have the time to devote to these, they can be significant advantages even before you get the investors. And you just look up incubators in your area and mm -hmm. see what they want, what would be involved with it. Sometimes it'll cost you, sometimes they will want equity in your company. A lot of different ways that they work now, but they can really help stimulate that growth before you get the investors and then direct you in that direction, in that direction, direct you in that direction. <laughs> We've done in the C department today. One of the things you want to think about is, again, thinking about investing, your, if you were to invest in you, how much risk is there, right? The, the, the more risk there is, the, the harder it's going to be, um, both in terms of getting the money and then how much you're going to have to give up. So you want to put off getting that equity investment as long as possible by getting some kind of revenue for yourself that does two things. One, obviously, it brings in money to keep you operating, which means you don't need to give up part of your company to keep operating. Uh, and two, if you're selling something, you've got some evidence that you have a market, right? If you just have an idea, you don't have anything. 
If you have customers, that's a big deal. I mean, uh, I, I've seen, uh, you know, I used to use uh, Dragon's Den um, videos in, in, in my class, and there was, there was one um, woman, she was selling uh, little trees, you know, for like weddings and stuff like that. And so the, the, the angels or the sharks or whatever you want to call them were like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she, somebody asked about how much she's selling and she's like, oh yeah, I've already sold like 10,000 or something like that. They're like, oh, okay, now we're interested. <laughs> yeah, so that, that makes a huge difference. So it's get out there and start selling. Um, that's just one of the most important things. You talked about um, basic business formation and how sometimes that's a stumbling block because you have to register and this and that. Um, there's how how do you who do you find out or who do you ask to find out for sure what you have to do because like if you look at the county's website, sometimes you need a business license, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you need to file ID numbers with a tax. You always need the federal ID number. But how do you know which pieces you need to have in place? Like, do you need a city ordinance, or do you need the county, or whatever? And what happens if you don't have that stuff in place, and, and do they catch you? Do you get in trouble? What happens, and how do you proceed? Because that's the stumbling block to starting a business, because you don't want to get in trouble. First oh, thing, you know, go ahead. <laughs> I'm very much of the, uh, uh, and uh, yes, I know I'm being recorded for this one. Uh, <laughs> Making an apology is a lot easier than not yep. starting. Uh, asking for forgiveness is, is the way to go on that. There are lots of sources I mentioned. If, are you in Georgia? Okay, so the UGA is, is the College Extension is a great place to start. In addition, banks are actually really helpful as long as they're a local bank. I haven't seen this at the, at the big ones necessarily. But uh, small banks and especially credit unions, they have folks who walk you through pretty much Mm -hmm. a lot of the basic legal things you will need and it's amazingly helpful I mean they're doing this stuff for their clients regularly anyway they know this this sort of thing so if you have a good relationship with your banker hit them up and start talking to them uh, about exactly these de details if you're in Georgia the thing you need right off the bat is go ahead and register with the Secretary of State's office that way you've got your name reserved with the Secretary of State you're in the books uh, the bank will help you through the process of getting EIN because they can't give you a bank account for your business until you have an EIN, so they're they're a great one there. Um, and uh, as the city is going to want you to register for everything, so uh, as much as I love the city in which I live, uh, I'd recommend getting a good look at what you need because once you start registering there, there you're paying a lot more for like for running out of your bit your home. Suddenly you're paying more for your water and sanitation because that just costs more. Your utilities in general can start going up because really businesses subsidize yeah. consumer utility usage. So just keep and an eye on those and make sure you're getting what you need along the way. And, and the other thing is to look at the SBA, Small Business Administration. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm going to say this as well because I've, I've over the years have done work back and forth with SBA, SBA reps. I, I still know people in, you know, in, in that space. Um, but if you start looking at SBA loans, which means they're backed by the Small Business Administration, understand that that also comes with a lot of baggage of its own. Um, I don't re recommend SBA loans frequently, depending on what your personal model is and whatnot, but the SBA, the Small Business Administration, does have a lot of really good resources. And a big question also is insurance needs. This is yeah. something that pops up a lot. So it really depends what you're doing, how much insurance you need above and beyond that. So that is also one to look into. Yeah. Um, so, so through all of this, you know, the money and everything, what about the, um, what are your thoughts on the interpersonal aspect of starting a business? Um, and my buddies say we're gonna we're gonna start this thing. We've written you know hundred thousand lines of code over five thousand hours, and then one day he sits down and says, "We're taking a left turn." And I say, "No, we're taking a right turn," <laughs> and we're both equally invested, and it's a brick wall. Um, I'm gonna say this: if you are in a deep business partnership, that's a lot more intimate than most marriages. <laughs> um, write down the rules of engagement for how you're going to resolve stuff. Do yep. it up front. Yep. Um, if you do that up front and you actually have it written down and say, this is our process, this mm -hmm. is how we're going to do it. And sometimes you are going to have to agree to bring in a third party just to help you have an external view. 
Yep. Yeah. We had a partnership agreement. One of the first things you should work up if you're working with other people and you're going to be sharing equity in the company with mm -hmm. them, just get that hammered out. Yep. Have your board set up. Even if it's just you with how the board functions. With my company, we had four partners, so that was the, the shareholders. Uh, so in order to avoid a tie vote, we would rotate the presidency annually, and whoever the president was had basically one extra share to vote. So if two people voted one way, two people voted the other way, uh, we would have a way to break the ties that we could all agree on. We generally operated on a consensus basis, which is if you can do that, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But uh, And there are all sorts of guidelines for how to deal with each other on a consensus basis, which I'd advise looking at. But those don't always work when the passions get flying, but a great basis right there. And the court consensus governance, consensus deal making, whatever, just Google those and it's all this good information on how to not have to get to the point where you're voting at all. And the only thing I'll add there too is healthy conflict between partners is actually good. Yep. Because yep. if you all agree all the time, you're yep. missing out on a lot of opportunities. Yep. And get him when you have an unhealthy conflict. <laughs> For a nominal fee, oh yeah, we're being recorded. At. <laughs> Hypothetically. <laughs> at one point, uh, you got on to the subject of SBA. I happen to be a volunteer with SCORE, which yep. is mm -hmm. a quasi-governmental relationship with SBA, and I would like to recommend that if anybody is thinking about setting up a business and they have not had prior experience, SCORE is free. Yep. You just call, do a quick Google, find SCORE in your local area, call them up, and you can get a hold of people who can give you some advice, which will save you a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it boils down to career counseling. Mm -hmm. I will say that about 90% of the time because it is hard starting your own business. But if you're really committed, that is a good place to start because, A, they're free. Yep. Mm -hmm. You can find, and they have very broad base. You can get a lot of particular information which can help structure it and then move you on to the next level of expertise that's required to set up your company. Are they a state or national yeah. organization? SCORE is a national organization. Yep. Yeah. S-C-O-R-E. S-C-O-R-E. Yeah, Service Corps of Retired Executives. Uh, actually, that's no longer. No, no they, they just, changed they, it. They just did a brand change oh. <laughs> because most, half of us are retired, but a lot of us are still working. Yeah. And so they said, stop saying Service Corps. <laughs> Uh, it's also trying to become a very diverse organization, both in terms of the expertise it provides, as well as women, minorities, etc. Yeah. And, and, and it is free, so low, low, low risk to talk to them. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I have score working with my students, and it's great. Yeah. yeah. Nothing else on the website where you can download all kinds yeah. of templates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's there there's a ton of free stuff out there. Um, going back to like the, the legal stuff, every state will have like a, a website. It's business one stop. These are all the things you need to do for this business. Um, and then you've got SCORE, you've got um, you know the SBAs. There's there's just tons and tons of free resources. So I'll definitely use that. I have a question. I'm okay. Just curious. For me, it's worked out rather well. I don't know if it would for a lot of people. How do y'all feel about the barter system? I know I have three different I kinds of lawyers time. that I trade out with, so I'm not paying any legal fees. I do it all the time. Yeah. I mean, I, I I have a lot of contacts, references, partners. I people work, you know, people I work with. If I need certain things done, yeah, you know, it's nothing to to go swap off services. Somebody needs some some consulting. Somebody needs some expertise. I swap, you know, like say play a little bit of shell game with different friends and whatnot to make mm -hmm. sure people have got the connections but absolutely because the other thing about being in business and, and I'm going to reiterate this if you want to be a business owner it is not a job if you want a job go get a job and work for somebody else if you want to own a business and be a business owner and be the CEO you are responsible if you're going to own the business own the business don't let the business own you but where that comes into play is if you're once you are that CEO, once you are that leader, network. You can't do it by yourself. You're going if you're going to be successful, you build a network of people, both in your industry and outside of it, to support it. You know, my my primary attorney is somebody I went to college with, and I've known for 30 years, so I know where all the skeletons are buried. 
as well as some of the blackmail pictures. But it, you know, having that network of friends and people that you build tight relationships with, that's where you start being able to cross-pollinate each other's businesses, efforts. So barter is just part of the name of the game once you build a network. Uh, I would add that, I mean, the, the nice thing about barter is that it, we mentioned this earlier, cash flow, right? Anything that's going to help your cash flow or not hurt your cash flow is important. One of the things I tell my students is that as long as you still have money in the bank to pay the bills, you're still in business. Um, because Pandora operated for like 10 years before they made any money. Uh, the additional thing that I like about bartering is it really helps you set your valuation. What are you worth? What are your services worth? What are these other things worth to you? How much of my time I'm willing to trade for their time? Uh, and it's another way, again, we're talking about validation of your business idea, mm -hmm. validation of your business skills as well. Yeah. Uh, so, oh. One last question, then we'll do our final plugs. Final <laughs> plugs. Um, with your students, do you notice anything that the ones that are successful do versus the ones that are not successful or like best practices that your students have in terms of their own startups? We have a really bad uh, tracking of our students afterwards, uh, but but my teaching is also, and the way we teach has been evolving rapidly. I have I have tossed out my course and started over from scratch three times now in twelve years, um, and it, I change it every semester, trying to constantly. I'm trying things. I I, I tell students I, I practice what I preach. I try see what works, and that's the only way you know how if it works is to do it. Um, and sometimes it's not going to go well. So sometimes, you know, I'm going to get some bad student <laughs> reviews uh, because something I tried just didn't work. But you know what? You learn from it and move on. The important thing is to try it and learn. Uh, we deal at the Georgia Game Developers Association. We deal uh, pretty closely with the Georgia Tech's CreateX program in addition to their Flashpoint. CreateX is a more student-oriented one than Flashpoint is. And one thing that I know the people there are very committed to is the idea of fail early and often. Yep. They just think that students who can do that effectively are the ones more likely to have their businesses succeed yep. when they're out of the program. Yeah, the other, the other part of that is fail cheap. <laughs> yeah, especially while fail you're in cheap. college. <laughs> fail cheap and don't wind up $10 million in debt when you can right. only be. Well, okay. sir, no more questions. Uh, I'm Andrew Greenberg. The Siege uh, Investment Conference information is up at siegecon.net, S-I-E-G-E-C-O-N-N-E-T.net. Our investment conference is October 4th. Uh, we have a career fair October 7th at the Siege Convention as well. Come to my panels uh, tonight, 10 p.m. if you're interested in virtual reality. We have some great uh, studios here in town who will be demoing or talking about what they do. And uh, tomorrow, 10 rules dealing with police encounters. This is my only panel, so afterwards, uh, I'm going to be turning into Luke Skywalker. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm Jim Nettles. I've got cards from a couple of my different projects going on over here. Uh, if you guys want to reach out, please feel free to do so. Um, I will Later tonight, we'll be doing an 1130 panel tonight on uh, love, sex, and relationships in the post-Me Too era. So somebody bring me alcohol. <laughs> um, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow we'll be doing one on social media again. Um, I will probably be back over on the writer's track here in a bit. Um, so I'll be running my mouth all over the place. Or you can usually find me in the Weston Bar. Yeah. <laughs> if you're buying alcohol, I usually will give at least some sort of advice. How good it is depends on how good a drink. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How good an advice you get depends on the quality. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the quality of the scotch. Uh. Okay. Oh, wait, don't, uh, don't forget to rate us in the app. Yes. All right, thank all right. you all very much. Thanks, Thanks much. much.